Well, good morning, Calvary. Hey, so glad to see you today. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving weekend. Grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 5, whether you've got that in a print or a digital form. Matthew chapter 5, not only welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary, but those of you joining us in Auditorium too. so glad that you are here today, those online, maybe you're joined by television or the podcast, so glad that you have taken the time to be with us. Uh, hopefully, if you're here with us today in the building, you were able to pick up the communion elements as you entered either on the upper level or on the lower level. They should be right there by the entrances. And so if you did not have a chance um, to, to gather those when you came in, would encourage you to do that. We'll be sharing in communion at the end of the service today. And if you're watching us uh, on a big screen somewhere, I hope that you'll take a moment and gather something to represent the, uh, the, the cup and the bread um, to join us at the Lord's table here in just a few moments. About a year and a half ago, um, we can, confession's good for the soul, isn't it? I'll confess this. I, I became a part of a club and it's become a little bit of a, addiction might be a strong word. Has anybody else got a smoker and started smoking meats at home? And do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody, brother, do you know what I'm talking about? When that brisket comes off that smoker and hits your taste buds, like you're changed for eternity. Like it's the, the pulled pork, the wings. And I'm, this may be an unpopular opinion, but I'm just gonna put it out here. I don't like turkey. I just, I don't like it. I don't like the taste of it. I don't, I don't know what it is until I cooked it on the smoker the last two years. And I'm a believer. And I'm sure the pilgrims used a smoker. I, I, that's the only reason we've been doing that for hundreds of years, right? It's just, it, and, and I don't know if you've gotten into this club. Some would call it a cult. But it's like, it's, once you get in, it's hard to get out. Um, we have our own language, we have our own equipment. Um, we have secrets. Don't you dare ask me what rub I used on my turkey. I'm not sharing that. And you start using your own language, right? You talk about brine, and rub, and bark, and basting, burnt ends. Anybody salivating? Right? So that's just kind of how this works. And here's what I've learned, though. Like, you... you you know, you, you put the meat in the smoker and it could, it's hours and hours that that thing could be in there. And some people have different schools of thought. Some people, you go over every so often and you open it up and you, you pretend that you're basting it or spritzing it. You're actually checking it. I've got another friend who says, if you're looking, it ain't cooking. So there's different schools of thought that people use. But here's the deal. At some point, you, you want to see this golden bark on the outside. You want it to look a certain way. But at some point, what you have to do, and I've got my fancy schmancy little thermometer here, is you have to go over and you have to take the probe and you have to check the inside. Because I don't care how good it looks on the outside, if it hasn't reached temperature on the inside, it's gonna make you sick. <laughs> like you, you've gotta make sure that the inside's done, that the inside's right, because if that hasn't happened, no matter what the outside's like, the inside is what really matters. This is the point that Jesus is trying to make in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's where we've been. And if you remember, we worked through the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five, and we're kind of working our way verse by verse, looking at what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. And after he gets done with the Beatitudes, he wants to stress something. Jesus is teaching his followers that life in the kingdom of God is different than life in the world's kingdom. He said in chapter four, and remember, we're working our way through the gospel of Matthew. We're just kind of moving verse by verse. I felt like the Lord dropped in my heart that we should, that we should teach our way through the book of Matthew and that we should do it kind of slow. So we're doing it kind of verse by verse. And I know, like, we might say some things and you might go, well, I don't like that. And I says, that's okay, I didn't say it, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so we're just, we're working our way through. And Jesus is saying, look, in chapter four, he said, I'm bringing my kingdom. And what he's showing you in chapter five is that his kingdom is different than the kingdom of the world, of the culture, of, of the, the, the area around us. And here's what he wants to show us, that life in God's kingdom is lived from the inside out. And we have a tendency to want to view things from the outside and see how they look. And do they match up to our religious ideas or do they fit what the world around us or what social media or what other people think we should be or should not be. And Jesus says, look, in my kingdom, I'm not so worried about the outside, I'm worried about the inside. 
Jesus, and this is where we get the, the title for this series, he flips the script, meaning he changes the idea. He says, look, you've heard it said one way, I'm gonna tell you another. Jesus flips the script to focus on inside and not the outside. And this is what he does in chapter five. He's giving us six very practical examples of how this gets lived out in our lives. How if Jesus has changed the inside, it's gonna affect who we are on the outside. So a couple weeks ago, we did one where he talked about anger and how we navigate anger in our lives. Last week, we had this real fun light message on, uh, what was it? Divorce, adultery, and, and, and lust. Wasn't that fun? That was a good time, wasn't it? And there's three more that we'll hit as we move through this. One today, and then we'll do two more as we start our Christmas series next week. And I, I know that, that, that sometimes we come to church and we want a message that makes us feel good or energizes us or inspires us for the things ahead. But when Jesus preached this sermon, before he got to the inspiring part, he, he did some probing. And he said, we need to check the inside because the inside is what really matters. Why? Because you can be right on the outside and still be wrong on the inside. And so today we're just gonna look at one more of the practical examples that Jesus gives to us about how important it is that our lives are right on the inside and how he flips the script on what the culture thinks at that time. Have any of you ever had someone make you a promise and then not keep it, anybody? This happened in the last service too. There's a good chance most of you are still in a slight coma from the turkey. So I'm gonna try that again and see how it goes. Anybody ever had somebody make you a promise and not keep it? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I thought, I thought, I thought it was, was more like that. And sometimes there's a good reason, right? Sometimes things change. I had some promises made to me in 2019 that were not kept in 2020 for good reason, right? Because the world changed. But sometimes people just, they break their word. Last week when we talked about marriage, the reason why some of those things were difficult for some of us to hear or talk about is because somebody made us promises and didn't keep them. A few weeks ago when we talked about anger, the reason that that hit home for some of us is because there were promises that were made and then someone broke them and acted like it was no big deal and didn't seem to care. It happens all the time, right? We, we elevate in our world that we should keep our word and yet... People tell lies and they say what they think other people want to hear and they break their promises all the time. It might be the boss, it might be a coworker, it could be a family member. Let's be honest, for some of you it's even happened in the church. And the passage we'll look at today on the outside, when you first look at it, might not seem as practical to some of us because we don't understand the, the context of the Old Testament and what Jesus was saying. And it can be a little bit of a heavy topic for us, but the reality is I don't know if there's one that's any more practical for us in our day-to-day -day lives. So today, here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about how to be a person of integrity. And we're gonna look at what Jesus says, this next example that he gives of these six examples in Matthew chapter five, where he talks about how to be a person of integrity. Integrity is a huge subject. We won't even scratch the surface. I mean, you could do a study just in the book of Proverbs alone. That would be weeks and weeks of, of teaching for us to look at. Today, we're just gonna look at these few verses from Jesus, Matthew chapter five, how he teaches us five things that are important for us to know about how to be a person of integrity. Let's jump in. Matthew chapter five, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said, if you've not been with us, in these six examples that Jesus gives, he starts all of them the same way. He's gonna say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. That's where he flips the script, right? He says, you thought it was this way, but I tell you, it's really like this. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. So Jesus here is quoting the Old Testament where he says, do not break your oath in this quote here. But he's not quoting just one passage. It's like he's paraphrasing several scriptures together. One of them is in Exodus chapter 20. It's one of the 10 commandments where God says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So how you use God's name matters. With that, we also have a passage like Numbers chapter 30, where we read, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, 
but must do everything he said. So Jesus says there is this principle in the Old Testament. It's how you use God's name. It's how you make a vow. It's how you give an oath. It's how you say, I will do this. And then you make some kind of statement to prove that you will do it. And what the Old Testament teaches us, and this is really important, number one, if you wanna be a person of integrity, number one, you keep your word. If you're gonna be a person of integrity, you keep your word. And these passages are pretty simple. They say that if you make a vow, then don't break it. If you're gonna tell someone you're gonna do something, then follow through. And the practice in scripture was that you would say, like, have you ever, have you ever heard somebody make some kind of vow and say, you know, on my mother, they'll say something like this, I'll, I'll come through with this. Or, you know, uh, cross my heart and hope to die. You ever heard that one? That's somewhere in the Bible, I think. You know, so you got, you got these things where people make these vows. Well, this was common in the Old Testament. It was common in Jewish times where they would say, well, based on the heavens, I will do this. Or based on um, Jerusalem, I will do this. They would make these vows. And what the scripture is saying is if you tell someone you'll do something, number one, if you want to be a person of integrity, keep your word. Why does that matter? I think it matters because words matter to God. The things you say are powerful. They are important. And words matter to God. Let me give you just real quick some scriptural understanding of this. To begin with, Genesis chapter one, verse three, this is creation, right? This is the very beginning. This is when God is making stuff. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Isn't it interesting? It doesn't say God flipped a switch. It doesn't say God made a light bulb. It says God spoke. When something came out of nothing, it came because God spoke it because there's creative power in our words. When we speak, something happens. So our words matter to God. They matter so much that the Bible says this, Proverbs 18, verse one, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Any of you ever had somebody say something to you that like, kind of like energized you and filled you with life? Anybody? Like they say something and you feel the impact of it? Anybody ever had somebody say something and it drained the life out of you? <laughs> It felt like something died inside. Like words are powerful. And I've had people do things that have physically hurt me in some way. But that's nothing compared to the words that people have spoken to me because those things stick in a whole different way. Not only do our words have creative power and do they have the power of life and death over other people, but we are made in the image of God, so God wants us to try to be like him, and let me show you what he's like. This is in the book of Numbers, chapter 23. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Does God keep his promises, yes or no? <laughs> he keeps his word, and so if that matters to him, it should matter to us. That's integrity. That's why we're talking about integrity today. Integrity matters because it's, it's when things come together. It's when what we say and what we do are fully integrated. That's where we get the idea of this word integrity, that things come together, that they're not one thing over here and another thing over there, but that they're whole, they're complete, they're, they're sound. The reality is, if you're gonna buy a house in normal times, you will want to get an inspection, true? <laughs> and what's, well, why do you wanna get an inspection? Because I want an inspector to walk through and look at the house and tell me, if it has integrity. I don't wanna buy a house and find out 18 months later that it's got all these foundation issues. I want a house that has structural integrity, that I know the foundation is secure. And the same thing's true in our lives internally. We wanna know that inside, in who we are, in who God's created us to be, that we have integrity. The Hyatt Regency in Kansas City was, was built in the late 70s. And it was during a time when um, in construction, there were a lot of fast-tracked projects. They had reduced oversight, major failures. And in this particular hotel, they had designed these really cool looking walkways at about the fourth and the second floors that were glass and concrete. They kind of went across. It was really kind of a cool little thing to see. But in 1981, there was a night where they had all these people down on the, the floor of the atrium for a big party. And they had people dancing and party goers that were up on these two walkways. And as that was happening, both walkways collapsed. Over 200 people were injured and 114 people lost their lives that day because 
there was no structural integrity to those walkways. There had been reduced oversight, there was neglect, there was irresponsibility, there was a lack of communication, design flaws, and those walkways progressively degraded to the point that they fell and killed over 100 people. And the problem was, they didn't have any integrity. And as that's a physical example, the same thing's true for each one of us as an individual. And the first thing we want to do if we are going to be a person of integrity, number one, is to keep our word. And that sounds easy, but we live in a, I won't blame the culture, I won't blame the world. Anybody else here human? Anybody? Help me. Right? As humanity, we are prone to do what the Pharisees did in Jesus' time. We've mentioned the Pharisees every, every time in this, this part of this series because Jesus is pointing out that they are telling you one way, but I'm telling you another. Because the Pharisees say, hey, you're gonna keep your vows. But they had this neat little thing that they were doing. Let me show you. Matthew chapter five, verse 34. Jesus says, that, you know, you've heard that you should keep your vows, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. And he's not talking about profanity here, that's a whole nother place in scripture where it talks about not using profanity. But here he's talking about an oath, a vow, making a promise. He says, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven for his God's throne or by the earth for it's his footstool. So here's what they were doing. They were making these promises. Now, if you picked up the first time around, that was talking about making promises and using God's name. By the name of God, I will keep this promise. But that's not what they're doing here. They're changing it a little bit. They're saying, well, well, by the heavens, I make this vow to you. Or, or by the earth, I give you my word. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. So here's what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were saying, look, if we make a promise in God's name, then we're taking God's name in vain if we don't keep it. So we'll make promises based on heaven or on earth or even on our noggins, and we'll make these promises. And then if we don't keep them, it's not that big of a deal. And what they had designed, they had whole documents pieced together in their literature at that time that taught you the formulas where you could make oaths, but if you didn't keep those vows, it wasn't that big of a deal. So even when I made you the promise in the back of my mind, I was already planning not to keep it. Here's what they had figured out. And this is what I want to encourage you. If you want to be a person of integrity, number two, stop looking for loopholes. Stop looking for the places where you can get out of doing the right thing. Because <laughs> they were looking for ways to say, well, if I do it this way, then I can skirt the rules. If I do it this way, I can get what I want. If I do it this way, I can just rationalize it away. And that was with promises in that day and time, but don't we do it in so many different ways? Everything from the way we look to cheat on our taxes, to tell little white lies so that we can get away from people we don't wanna talk to. <laughs> Like we do it in so many different ways and every time we do it chips away at our integrity. And we say, well, I play by my own rules or I do things my own way. And that's what scripture calls being a hypocrite. And that's a dangerous thing. Proverbs chapter 10 verse nine says this, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. That's a good promise, isn't it? <laughs> yes? Okay, good. But... Whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Busy travel weekend, suitcase had been checked at the gate and was on its way through to the plane and TSA was screening these things and it went through one of those x-ray devices. You ever, you ever watched them do this where it's going through on a conveyor belt? And this one stopped and then they took it back. They took it back again and looked at it. Bob, come over here and look at this. What's that look like to you? What does it look like to you? I think it looks like a cat. <laughs> well, that's what I think it is too. So Bob and Fred took it off the belt. It's a true story. I don't know if their names were Bob and Fred. <laughs> but I, I, like, I think it's funny that way, don't you? And they opened it up and inside was a live cat. And so there, and the cat was like real chill, didn't try to run away. So they kind of took care of it, wasn't harmed through all that stuff. They found out whose bag it was. They, they paged the guy and he comes walking up. It was Delta Airlines, walks up to the Delta desk and they're like, sir, you have a live cat in your suitcase. He claims he didn't know. 
He says like, well, I know that cat, but it belongs to someone else at my house. So either like he's being real sneaky or he's got a really funny family member <laughs> who knows how to pull very bad pranks. And whatever it was, the cat was fine. It was really weird because you have a live cat in the top of your suitcase and some of the fur was actually sticking out of the zipper. It's kind of crazy, but the cat wasn't harmed and the guy missed his flight, but he flew out again. And the, the moral of the story is just be careful. Somebody's going to let the cat out of the bag. It's a true story, but it's a, it was a funny joke. <laughs> But if Jesus were to probe inside of the baggage you carry, if he were to take and look inside, what would he find in you? All the places where you look to get by with something and hope you don't get caught? All the places where you say one thing but you actually mean another or do another? The problem with the Pharisees in that time is they were just constantly looking for the loopholes. And Jesus is calling this out. He's saying, look, th this is not the way that God would have for it to be. In fact, he puts it really in perspective. L let's go back. Can I read those verses for you again? Starting with verse 34, because I want to point out something different this time. He says, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, because they were saying, well, well I I'll tell you, by heaven I'll do that for you. And he says, but it's God's throne. You think if you don't say his name that somehow you're not breaking your promise but isn't heaven God's anyways? And he says, or by the earth, for it's God's footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. He's like, you're not fooling anybody. It's all still God's. Look what he says in verse 36. And do not swear by your head. What a weird thing, isn't that? Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Jesus is saying, look, you're trying to skirt the rules and you think if you just don't bring in God's name, somehow you're not breaking his law. But here's the reality. Here's the third thing. If you want to be a person of integrity, remember who's in charge. <laughs> like, because no matter what it is that you try to pull a fast one, Jesus says, it's all still God's. He's all still in control. It's all still him at the end of the day. Did you, did you ever try to pull a fast one, but you wouldn't do it while your mom and dad were watching? Anybody? <laughs> Like, I'll try it when they're not watching. When they're, when, they're, when they're watching, I'm a perfect angel. But when they're gone, I'm sneaky Pete, right? Isn't that how it goes? And this is what he's saying. He's like, you, you think God's not watching because you don't use his name? Heaven's his. Earth is his. The city of Jerusalem, he's the king. So remember who's in charge. The next time you're tempted to look for that loophole, the next time you're tempted to hide a feline in your Samsonite. Remember, he's watching, and here's what he wants you to see. God is great. Like, he, he's greater than you realize. He's the king of heaven and an earth. And so he's over everything, and God is sovereign. Like, you're trying to pull a fast one, but he's in complete control. That, that, that verse cracks me up where it says, do not swear by your head because you don't even have power to control whether your hair is black or white. And I can attest to that. I saw a picture from a few years back and I was like, who's that very young man, <laughs> right? Because this has changed a lot in the last few years. I tell the church it's my family's fault. I tell my family it's the church's fault. <laughs> but it's just, it's heredity, it's biology. I think it's quite attractive, <laughs> right? So here's, here's the thing though, but I had no control over that. I can't change that. I can't affect that. And there's so many things in life we think, well, if I can find the loophole, if I can pull a fast one, if, if I can just get them to hear what they want to hear, then I'll get what I want. And he says, look, God's sovereign. You're not even in control. Life and blessing and favor comes when you trust him. Like this is a really good opportunity for us to go back to that idea of structural integrity because some of us need to take a look inside of our lives before there's some kind of major collapse in how we walk and ask God to be the architect and ask God to be the engineer and ask God to be the one who builds those things, that he's the contractor, that he's the inspector in our lives. I, I shared, if you were here last week, that my mom passed away earlier this month, so you, you, you think about and you... You talk about a lot of things, and we went through. My mom, I'm so thankful for this. She, I don't know, she loved paper. 
And she just was always writing stuff down and in various places we found where she said over the years, the verse that I try to live my life by is Psalm 1914. And this is that passage, Psalm 1914 says, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And I guess I've read, I've, I've heard those, anybody ever heard that verse before? <laughs> like I've heard it a thousand times, but it means something a little bit different to me this week than it did a month ago. Because at some point, we're all gonna stand before the architect and the engineer and the inspector. And I wanna know that before I ever even get to that point, I'm saying to my rock, which means the one that is actually my foundation that gives structural integrity, Lord, take a good look at my mouth and my words. And God, take a good look at my heart. Because at the end of the day, when I stand before you, I want it to be pleasing in your sight. So, so Jesus is talking to the people. Remember, he's saying, look, we're, we're doing things different than we used to, and we're looking at the inside out, and he's gonna give them another thought. So let's go one, one last verse. This is the last verse from the Sermon on the Mount that we'll look at today, Matthew chapter five, verse 37. Jesus has said, you've heard it said to keep your vows. I'm saying, don't, don't even make a vow. Don't even make an oath, because all those things, you're just looking for loopholes. He says, instead, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. He doesn't use that phrase a whole lot in the Gospel of Matthew. He's talking about the devil here. It's a few times, we'll look at one here in just a moment. But what he's saying is, look, anything other than integrity structurally in your heart actually comes from the evil one. So if you wanna be a person of integrity, here's the fourth thing, number four, discern the work of the evil one. Because I'll tell you, the evil one would love to trash your integrity. Isn't that true? <laughs> because for many of us, if you lose your character, if you lose your integrity, you lose so much. And Jesus says, look, if you're looking for a loophole, if you're fudging on your character, what you're actually doing is being distracted and deceived by the one who wants to destroy your soul which is why he says, we'll get to this when we, when we get into January and we start talking about the next part of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter six, verse 13, this is the Lord's prayer. One of the key things he teaches us to pray is he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the who? <laughs> Evil one, why? Because he has schemes and he wants to destroy you. Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter two, verse 11, here, here he's talking about forgiveness and bitterness, but it applies in so many different areas of our lives. We live in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. And yet sometimes I think we are. Like Paul's trying to say, look, you, you know he's scheming. You, you know he wants to have these little lies and these things that you want people to believe and this hypocrisy that you, you never think will get out of the bag, you want that to move you forward to accomplish the things you want to accomplish. Isn't it funny the things we'll do if we think it'll help us to win? And he says, be careful, because those are the enemy's schemes. Instead, he says this, Ephesians chapter six, verse 11, he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He says, look, do not be deceived. Do not be unaware. Instead, stand firm because the devil is out to get you. Frank Hayes started just working in the stables at Belmont Park in New York. And he went on to be a, a jockey and on June 4th, 1923, he won his first race. He was riding a horse called Sweet Kiss. It was a long shot. No one expected this horse to win. But Sweet Kiss was the first one to cross the finish line. The crowd went crazy. People could not believe that Sweet Kiss had won. And as it crossed the finish line, Frank Hayes tumbled out of the saddle, landed on the ground. A doctor ran out and he was pronounced dead on the spot. And all they can figure is somewhere between the last hurdle that the horse jumped and the finish line, he had a massive heart attack and he died. Only man recorded known to have won a horse race dead. And they looked into it and they tried to figure out why. And the only thing they can figure is that the day before the race, someone came to him and said, hey, look, according to the regulations here, 
you are overweight for a jockey in this race. So you have to lose 10 pounds in the next 24 hours. You have to lose 10 pounds in the next 24 hours. Does that remind any of you of life since Thursday? <laughs> so you know what he did? He got up early that morning and he went out and he jogged and he ran and he deprived himself of food and he sweated and he did not drink water. And when he climbed in the saddle, people noticed right there before the race that he was weak and that he was tired. And somebody said, Frank, you can win this thing. You just got to cheat yourself a little bit. You just got to do these things this one time. And if you'll just, I know it's not wise, it's not good for you, it's not the thing you should do. But Frank, if you just do this this one time, you can win. And he did. And in his winning, he lost everything. And we have an enemy whose schemes we're not unaware of, who says, if you will just do this, or if you'll just do that, or if you'll just make this unwise decision, or if you'll just push the limits this one time, I promise you, you can win. But what happens is in that winning, we lose everything. Does that make sense? So Jesus says, look, if, if it's not coming from a place of integrity in the structure of your life, then it's coming from the evil one. And he only wants to steal and kill and destroy. So one last time, one last verse, last thing Jesus says to us in this passage, Matthew chapter five, verse 37. What's the answer to this? How do you live a life of integrity? All you need to say is simply yes or no. You wanna be a person of integrity? Jesus says you don't need to make oaths. You don't need to make promises. You don't need to try to impress people with your words, with how spiritual you are, or convince them that you're going to do something. He says, you know what you need to do? You need to live in such a way so that when you say yes, people know you mean yes. And when you say no, people know you mean no. Last thing, I know it's overly simple, but this is what he tells us. Number five, if you wanna be a person of integrity, then live a life of integrity. Because based on the life you live, people will know whether they can trust you or not. Based on the life that you live, they'll know who you are. Here's how you become a person of integrity. Jesus says, let your yes be yes, and your no be no, and don't leave people any room to wonder if you really mean it. And it, this seems like a passage that we can skim right over, yet Jesus will hit it again in Matthew 23. We'll get there eventually. But also in James, James says this. Now, James is writing... Decades later, James was the earthly brother of Jesus. He was a disciple. He probably had heard Jesus teach some of these things. And he says, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or anything else. Doesn't that sound like what Jesus said? <laughs> so this must have really been a cultural issue of people fudging on their integrity. He says, all you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. He's saying, look, stop trying to impress people. Stop trying to curry favor. Instead, just live your life like a person of integrity. How do you do that? Let me rapid fire give you four quick thoughts. If you're saying, well, Chad, I haven't, or I need to, or I want to do this, start by being faithful. Like, that's the key. Just, just if you're gonna live a life of integrity, start by being a person of integrity. Be faithful, be genuine, be real, be reliable. Be a disciple of Jesus who shows others that you're a person whose yes is yes and no is no. And then do this. Don't try to cover up your mistakes because the reality is, as much as I wanna say that I've never been a hypocrite, as much as I wanna say that I've never had a lapse of integrity, I've been human. Anybody else? And so at some point, your kids are gonna see it. And at some point, your coworkers are gonna see it. And at some point, people that are watching you and how you live out your faith are gonna see it. And in those moments, don't try to cover it over. Be honest enough. You know what's one of the hazards of preaching a sermon like this? You have to look in the mirror and go, I'd like to think I always got it right, but I didn't always get it right. And you and I won't always get it right. And in those moments, that's where the beauty of grace and forgiveness can be seen. And let me encourage you with this. Here's another one. Make sure your walk matches your talk. Make sure that what you say matches up to how you live. Can I just real quick give you another thing I've been thinking since my mom passed? I've gotten multiple messages 
from kids I grew up with. Guys that used to come over to my house after church on a Sunday or guys we used to hang out together. And I thought they were just over at my house hanging out. I didn't realize that they were watching my mom and dad and how they lived. And in the weeks since my mom has passed, I've gotten multiple messages from these dudes that I thought we were just playing video games in the basement who said, I watched how your dad treated your mom. And I watched the way that your mom responded to us. And I just thought we were chilling. And my mom just thought we were hungry. (laughs) When that whole time, she was influencing. What you think you're just living your life, you're creating memories for other people. And your kids are watching, and your grandkids are watching, and they're seeing things that you say, well, that was just another Saturday, but they say that shaped the course of my life. So make sure that your walk matches your talk. The one more that we don't have time to unpack, but just think about this. Do not run from difficult things. Do you know when you really need integrity? In the tough seasons. And do you know when your integrity or lack of it will really show up? In the difficult times. So when those things come, Don't run from them, to which point, if you're like me, you're sitting there going, but I'm not perfect. I've dropped the ball more times than I care to mention, and there's places where my life just hasn't been right, which is why we need Jesus, isn't it? It's why we come to the Lord's table today, because he went to the cross and died for us because he knew that on our own, our structural integrity would just fall apart. And what we needed was his forgiveness and his grace and his help. And if you're wrestling in this area of integrity in some way, for some of us, this is a good reminder. For others of us, man, God's taking a temperature on you right now and you might not like it. (laughs) And before we come to the Lord's table, that's important for us to consider. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 Paul's giving instructions here on times of communion. And he says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. He goes on to say then that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. What does he mean by discerning the body of Christ? He means that you let the Holy Spirit take your temperature internally and see if who you're trying to be on the outside matches up to who you are on the inside. If there's a lapse of integrity in the structure of your life. I told you about the the walkways that collapsed in the Hyatt Regency in Kansas City. Do you remember that? Was anybody awake then? Do you remember that? (laughs) They went back and did an inspection. And they found that there were meetings that should have happened to review the plans that never happened. And because those meetings never happened, there were calculations that should have been done that were disregarded. There were workers on that project that could tell it wasn't secure and refused to take heavy wheelbarrows across and they would find other ways to get from one spot to another because they knew it wasn't right. And there were all kinds of people that talked about it and I told you that there was a structural problem and you told me that you knew it, but I assumed that you said something and you assumed that I said something, but nobody said anything. And they asked the guy whose signature was on the plans, the guy who was the one that signed off on it, who later went on to be a huge proponent of safety and upgrading things in engineering. And he said that any first year engineer student could have figured out that it was flawed if only it had been checked. So the Holy Spirit says, before you come to the Lord's table, take a minute and check the integrity of your life. And is there any place where you need to say, God, I I know that this is not pleasing to you. So something needs to change. In fact, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment? Or just in this room, or if you're watching this on a screen somewhere, listening to this message. Would you let the Holy Spirit take a look on the inside of your life? And is there something that needs to change? Is there some place where maybe you haven't kept your word? Maybe your walk hasn't matched your talk. 
And right now you need to just say, God, will you help me? Jesus, will you forgive me? And then Holy Spirit, will you give me the strength and courage to live my life out in a way that has integrity and honors you? And some of us, we, we hear this message and it's, it's a good reminder and we're thankful for the way the Lord has helped us. For others, it's a spotlight on some things that need to be changed. And for some of us, it's a moment where you say, I don't, I don't need just help with integrity. I need help with my life. And I know I need forgiveness because my way isn't cutting it. And I can't do it on my own anymore. And I know that today I need what only Jesus can bring. And I need his forgiveness to change my life. And I need his life to give me purpose. There's no better time than right now in this moment to say, Jesus, I need you as my savior. I need you as my Lord and I give you my life. And, and before we come to the Lord's table, I just wanna lead us in a simple prayer. If you're here today and you know that Jesus is your savior and your Lord, that your sins are forgiven and that you have the promise of spending eternity in heaven with him, then I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me. Or if today you say, Jesus, I can't do it on my own anymore. I give you my life. Then I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer with us as well. I'll, I'll lead us and then you, you repeat this after me. It's not in the words as much as it's in our hearts. But would you, would you join me in praying this? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus for sending your son to die for my sin. And I ask today that you would forgive my sin and be my savior. I give my life to you, my risen Lord. Take a look inside if there is anything that is not pleasing to you. Would you help me, Holy Spirit, to make things right and through your power and your grace to live a life of integrity for you in Jesus' name, amen. As you take the communion elements and pull back that first layer, Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread that is a symbol of the broken body of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, not because I was so perfect and I earned it, not because we lived in a way that we deserved it, but instead that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ, you died for us. And so we thank you for your sacrifice and we remember it today in Jesus' name, amen. Let's share in the bread together. And as you open the cup, Paul goes on to say that in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Father, we thank you for this cup that symbolizes the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we can get so used to the story that we forget that there's no life without the blood and that there's no forgiveness without the blood of Jesus. And there's no healing, that we have no hope without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, we thank you and we remember your sacrifice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's share in the cup together. And can I ask you to stand with me if you would please uh, before we just wrap up this service and 
I want to I want to thank you. You know, we're working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and even when we get into chapter six, it's going to take a little bit of a different tone, and he's going to he's going to help us in some different practical ways. And we're in this spot right now. So, sometimes I know you come to church and you're like, I want to feel good, and instead you just get probed. You know what I mean? <laughs> but he says, if you want to live a life of joy and freedom and peace and God's favor on the outside, it starts on the inside. And so, Lord, thanks for your word that takes a look in our hearts. And, Lord, we rejoice to know that the reason we look inside is so that in every area of our lives, we can live a life that's filled with the righteousness and the peace and the Holy Spirit that comes in the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, would you help us open our minds, open our hearts to hear from your spirit. God, may we live in a way that pleases and honors you with an integrity that comes based on who you are in our lives. Father, thanks for the good things you're doing through your church. As we go from here, would you go with us? Send us out with your special favor and with your wonderful peace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.